this is Dr. Moore, and as we move on, we're getting into post-Freudian, or psychodynamic theory. Melanie Klein developed object relations theory, and she's considered to be one of the most influential people in psychodynamic theory. Unlike Freud, she worked directly with troubled children. She was a pioneer in child and play therapy. Object relations theory addresses the observation that people live in two worlds simultaneously the external world and the internal world, with a commingling between the two. Individuals tend to act and react not only with an actual other, but also an internal other, a psychic representation of a person which in itself has the power to influence both the individual's affective states and his or her behavioral reactions. Here is an outline of this lecture. We'll start with an overview of object relations theory. And we'll continue with a brief biography of Melanie Klein. We'll introduce object relations theory looking at some of the main concepts including the psychic life of the infant, positions, psychic defense mechanisms, internalizations, and we'll look at uh, later views on object relations. We'll continue with how psychotherapy is conducted using this theory along with related research looking at some of the concepts. We'll conclude with a critique of object relations theory and of the concept of humanity expressed through this theory. Many personality theorists have accepted some of Freud's basic assumptions while rejecting others. Object relations theory from Melanie Klein and others extended it. Unlike Jung and Adler who came to reject Freud's theories, Klein tried to validate them. Basically, Klein extended Freud's developmental stages downward to the first four to six months after birth. Klein stressed that an infant's drives are directed toward an object. Object refers to the object of a person's desire, attention, or drive. Think of the object of my affection. So, it most often refers to a person, most often one's mother. Objects can be internal, operating in one's internal world, or external, operating in the real world. The theory analyzes how a person interacts with internal or external objects to understand personality. If it is internal, is it real? No, it is a mental representation. Object relations theorists believe the personality results from the internalization of external interaction patterns with objects, namely their primary caregivers. The relationships become templates, if you will, for all future relationships, so these early relationships are carefully analyzed to understand problems later in life. According to Klein, this begins at a very young age as the infant's drives, such as hunger, are directed toward an object, such as the mother's breast. This very early experience is unrealistic or fantasy-like, and it affects all future relationships. Klein and other theorists theorized on the importance of the child's early experiences with the mother. Important interaction patterns start with the mother and these interactions are powerful. The mother provides a social reference. Fantasies are imaginal representations of bodily instincts and urges. The infant feels these in the body as well as mentally. They are very vivid because early on the infant can't tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Frustrations and discomfort are felt as if they were an attack by a hostile force. This resembles the irrational world of adult psychosis, but it is normal for infants. Klein's concept of fantasy covers the developing child's relationship to a world of internal objects. In her thought, this kind of play activity inside a person is known as unconscious fantasy. Klein extended and developed Sigmund Freud's understanding of the unconscious mind. By analyzing children's play, much as Freud had analyzed dreams, she explored the uncharted territory of the mind, of the infant, finding an early Oedipus complex and the earliest roots of the superego. Like Freud's theory, drives have the goal of reducing tension to achieve pleasure. The object of the drive is any person, part of a person, or thing through which the goal is satisfied. 
Klein believed that infants begin life with an inherited predisposition to reduce the anxiety that they experience early in life as a result of the conflict between the life instinct and the death instinct. Klein assumed that very young infants possess an active, unconscious fantasy life. The most basic fantasies are images of the good breast and the bad breast. Remember, drives have an object, but Klein emphasized the child's relationship with those objects, which she saw as having a life of their own within a child's fantasy world. The term object refers to any person or part of a person that infants introject or take into their psychic structure and later project onto other people. An important part of any relationship involves the mental representations of early significant objects, such as the mother's breast, that have been introjected and then projected onto one's partner. These internal pictures are not accurate representations, but are remnants of each person's earlier experiences. For example, if an infant approaches a mother and the mother avoids him, he may later grow up projecting onto a partner uh, representations of the mother as uncaring and uh, unnurturing. Now it is also important to note that these introjections have both a positive valence and a negative valence, and they are kept separate or completely apart. This is because the ego isn't developed enough in infants and young children to integrate the two. So the most important task in the first years of life is to integrate the good and the bad into a realistic understanding of another person and avoid defense mechanisms like splitting. When a young child is abused or lacks any control over the situation, a common strategy is to split the object into good and bad aspects. They then internalize the bad aspect, making the external uncontrollable object good and the self bad. To emotionally survive, abused children may hate themselves and love their abusive caregivers. This results in a pattern of continued victimization in adulthood. The focus of treatment is then to identify and integrate the good and bad parts to create realistic perceptions of others and new relationship patterns. Instincts, as part of one's biology, are present from birth. The newborn infant's world at the outset is a bodily world, and fantasy represents the infant's attempts at transforming somatic events into a mental form. Now, Klein's conception of instinct is related to Freud's instinct theory, but differs in three important ways. One, it emphasizes consistent patterns of interpersonal relationships. Two, it stresses maternal nurturing and intimacy. And three, it views relatedness as the prime motive of human behavior. There is less emphasis on biologically based drives and more importance placed on consistent patterns of interpersonal relations. Now, while Freud's theory is paternalistic, emphasizing the power and control of the father, object relations theory tends to be more maternal stressing the intimacy and nurturing of the mother. Object relations theory generally sees human contact and relatedness, not sexual pleasure, as the prime motive of human behavior. Klein is a tragic figure in psychoanalysis. Her life was filled with loss and turmoil and is seen in the rather grim picture she paints of her special area the early months of infancy and the psychotic anxieties she theorized occurred during early life. She was born in Vienna in 1882, the youngest of four children. They lived in Vienna and survived through Klein's mother's hard work as a shopkeeper. Klein's mother let her know that she was unintended, and Klein was deeply jealous of her sister, Emily, who her father preferred. Another sister, Sidoni, died at the age of eight. A biography of Klein revealed the family was entangled and neurotic. Klein's father died, leaving the family struggling financially. Klein's later marriage was never a success, and her husband traveled a lot. They had three children between 1904 and 1914. She sank into deep depressions during this period, perhaps postnatal depression.
impressions. In 1914, her mother died, and it was during this period of crisis that she discovered psychoanalysis. She entered psychoanalysis with Sandor Ferenczi in 1914 and became greatly attached to him. He supported her desire to become an analyst, which seemed to help her overcome her depression. She then began to work in an underdeveloped field, psychoanalysis of children. She had trouble finding patients at first, so she analyzed her own children and presented them disguised as case studies. And it was not unusual to do that during that time period. She was a controversial figure at the time because she delved into the psychic life of infants. But she was very effective, which probably kept her from going into depression again. Other psycho analysts didn't take well to her because she was relatively undereducated. Uh, she didn't have a PhD or an MD, and she was divorced when being divorced was scandalous. She eventually moved to London in 1927, where she died in 1960. She lost her son Hans, who died in a climbing accident in Czechoslovakia in 1934. Klein was in an almost continual state of mourning through much of her life. She used her pain to investigate the early stages of loss, guilt, and loneliness that made up much of her life. When she died in 1960, her last weeks in the hospital, she heard the uh, crying of a baby next door, which upset her deeply. She seems to have felt closest to children who were suffering. She could relate to the pain. Many of her child patients remember her with great affection. Truly, she seemed to have insight into the psychological life of children. Now let's move on to take a closer look at some of the main terms and concepts in object relations theory. Object was the term chosen by Freud to designate the target of the drives, the other, real or imaginary, toward whom the drive is directed. Now, Klein agreed with Freud that uh, drives have an object, but she was more likely to emphasize the child's relationship with these objects, such as the parent's face, hands, breast, which she saw as having a life of their own within the child's fantasy world. And Klein assumed that very young infants possess an active, unconscious fantasy life. Their most basic fantasies are images of the good breast and the bad breast. Fantasies are defined as primitive, internalized, and unconscious mental images of instincts and drives. Ultimately, the unique mental and emotional capacities of an individual result from the interaction of these fantasies with actual experience and the emotion that ensues. For example, a newborn's rooting re reflex will only become a mental image once the newborn finds the nipple and begins nursing. The repetition of this activity over time forms a mental image accompanied by the soothing emotions that ensue. Therefore, the degree of fulfillment of the infant's needs largely implicates self-development. In Klein's view, fantasies interact reciprocally with experience in the world to form the developing emotional and intellectual characteristics of each individual. In their attempts to reduce the conflict produced by the good and bad images, infants organize their experience into positions or ways of dealing with both internal and external objects. Klein described the earliest stages of infantile psychic life in terms of a successful completion of development through certain positions. A position for Klein is a set of psychic functions that correspond to a given phase of development always appearing during the first year of life, but which are always present thereafter and can be reactivated at any time. There are two major positions, the paranoid schizoid position and the subsequent depressive position. The earlier, more primitive position is the paranoid schizoid position. And if an individual's environment and upbringing are satisfactory, she or he will progress through the depressive position. The paranoid schizoid position is a state of mind of children from birth to four or six months of age. The struggles that infants experience with the good breast and the bad breast lead to two separate and opposing feelings, a desire to harbor the breast and a desire to bite or destroy it. To tolerate these two feelings, the ego splits itself by retaining parts of its life and death instincts while projecting other parts onto the breast. 
It then has a relationship with the ideal breast and the persecutory breast. To control this situation, infants adopt the paranoid schizoid position, which is a tendency to see the world as either good or bad. Klein saw the depressive position as an important developmental milestone that continues to mature throughout the lifespan. The splitting that characterizes the earlier phase are succeeded by the capacity to perceive that the other who frustrates is also the one who gratifies. According to Klein, children adopt various psychic defense mechanisms to protect their ego against anxiety aroused by their own destructive fantasies. Klein defined introjection as the fantasy of taking into one's own body the images that one has of an external object, especially the mother's breast. Infants generally introject good objects as a protection against anxiety, but they also introject bad objects in order to gain control of them. The fantasy that one's own feelings and impulses reside within another person is called projection. Children project both good and bad images, especially onto their parents. Infants tolerate good and bad aspects of themselves and of external objects by splitting or mentally keeping apart incompatible images. Splitting can be beneficial to both children and adults because it allows them to like themselves while still recognizing some unlikable qualities. Projective identification is the psychic defense which infants use to split off unacceptable parts of themselves and then project them onto another object and finally interjecting them in an altered form. Now projective identification is interesting because what is projected is part of the self and there is an unconscious identification with the other person. Now this can lead to trying to control the other person which can lead to the other person acting in a way to confirm the projection. Jealousy is a good example. A person is jealous of his partner's relationship with her men, but says it is because of her behavior. His jealousy causes her to be more secretive, which confirms his hypothesis about her. And this leads to a negative spiral in the relationship. As we've learned, children adopt various psychic defense mechanisms and Klein referred to introjection as the fantasy of taking into one's own body the images that one has of an external object. After introjecting external objects, infants organize them into a psychologically meaningful framework, a process that Klein called internalization. Internalizations are aided by the early ego's ability to feel anxiety to use defense mechanisms and to form object relations in both fantasy and reality. However, a unified ego emerges only after first splitting itself into two parts, those that deal with the life instinct and those that relate to the death instinct. Klein believed that the superego emerged much earlier than Freud had thought. To her, the superego preceded rather than followed the Oedipus complex. Klein also saw the superego as being quite harsh, cruel, and judgmental. Klein believed that the Oedipus complex begins during the first few months of life, then reaches its zenith during the genital stage at about three or four years of age, the same time that Freud had suggested it began. Klein also believed that much of the Oedipus complex is based on children's fear that their parents will seek revenge against them for their fantasies. For healthy development during the Oedipal years, children should retain positive feelings for each parent. According to Klein, the little boy adopts a feminine position very early in life and has no fear of being castrated as punishment for his sexual feelings toward his mother. Later, he projects his destructive drive onto his father, whom he fears will castrate him. The male Oedipus complex is resolved when the boy establishes good relations with both parents. The little girl also adopts a feminine position toward both parents quite early in life. She has a positive feeling for both her mother's breast and her father's penis, which she believes will feed her with babies. Sometimes the girl develops hostility toward her mother, whom she fears will retaliate against her and rob her of her babies. But in most cases, the female Oedipus complex is resolved without any jealousy toward the mother. 
If you made it this far in the lecture, you are probably at least a little confused. Hopefully, not as confused as a chameleon in a bag of Skittles. Object relations theory is not an easy theory to explain in simple language. The object relations perspective, now remember the term object refers to a person, uh, this perspective views the individual's earliest relationships with primary caregiving figures as focal points for understanding how he or she relates to others as an adult. Central to this way of thinking is that all people construct mental representations of self in relation to others that become influential in both the conscious and unconscious mind. Later views of object relations will probably seem more relevant to understanding personality. Other theorists expanded and altered Klein's theory, placing emphasis on different aspects of early development. And they helped us to more clearly understand how early personality development influences our relationships in later life. Notable among them are Margaret Mailer, Heinz Kohut, John Bowlby, and Mary Ainsworth. Margaret Mailer was a native of Hungary who practiced psychoanalysis in both Vienna and New York. She developed her theory of object relations from careful observations of infants as they bonded with their mothers during the first three years of life. Mailer believed that children's sense of identity rests on a relationship with their mother. First, infants have basic needs cared for by their mother. Then they develop a safe symbiotic relationship with an all-powerful mother. The child eventually emerges from their mother's protective circle and establishes their separate identity. In general, Mailer's work was concerned with the infant's struggle to gain autonomy and a sense of self. In their progress toward achieving a sense of identity, children pass through a series of three major developmental stages. The first is normal autism, which covers the first three to four weeks of life, a time when infants satisfy their needs within the all-powerful protective orbit of their mother's care. Second is normal symbiosis, when infants behave as if they and their mothers were an omnipotent symbiotic unit. Third is separation individuation, from about four months until three years, a time when children are becoming psychologically separated from their mothers and achieving individuation, or a sense of personal identity. Heinz Coet was a native of Vienna who spent most of his professional life in the United States. More than any of the other object relations theorists, Coet emphasized the development of the self. In caring for their physical and psychological needs, adults treat infants as if they had a sense of self. The parents' behaviors and attitudes eventually help children form a sense of self that gives unity and consistency to their experiences. Coet's ideas have been applied to understanding narcissistic personality disorder. Coet held that narcissistic psychopathology is due to a lack of parental empathy during childhood. He believed that in their childhood, narcissistic personalities were never valued for themselves. They were valued only when they met their parents' expectations. Therapists help by providing healthy, validating emotional interactions that they missed as children. Next is John Bowlby and his attachment theory. Bowlby, a native of England, received training in child psychiatry from Melanie Klein. Bowlby said, we have an evolutionary need for attachment to a primary caregiver for normal social and emotional development. By studying human and other primate infants, Bowlby observed three stages of separation anxiety, protest, apathy and despair, and emotional detachment from people, including the primary caregiver. Children who reach the third stage lack warmth and emotion in their later relationships. And there are two fundamental assumptions to his theory. Caregivers must give a secure base for the child. And these bonding relationships become internalized and they act as a model or template for future relationships. Mary Ainsworth was born in Ohio in 1919 and died in 1999. She and her colleagues developed a technique called the strange situation for measuring one of three types of attachment styles. She was influenced by John Bowlby. The three attachment styles are secure, anxious resistant, 
and anxious avoidant. You can see uh, an example of the strange situation uh, in one of the videos in this week's module. The goal of Kleinian psychotherapy was to reduce depressive anxieties and persecutory fears and to lessen the harshness of internalized objects. To do this, Klein encouraged her patients to re-experience early fantasies and pointed out the differences between conscious and unconscious wishes. Klein thought all children should be psychoanalyzed and she substituted play therapy for dream work. All Freudians believe childhood experiences shape adult personality. Klein found ways to examine these early imprints even as they are forming. She was amazed to discover how intensely children are involved in a world of play. Her extended work with very small children gave her great insight into what she called the inner world of internal objects juxtaposed on the outer world of external objects. She was able to discover how the child projected these inner objects and the feelings associated with them onto the objects in the room where the play therapy took place. Melanie Klein was the originator of play therapy, but this theory has been expanded far beyond her original theories. Today, play therapy is used in many different styles of therapy and with many different child clients. Klein realized that play was a way to connect and communicate with children in a way that could not be achieved verbally. This concept is what makes play therapy so versatile with children, especially those who are nonverbal or who have experienced extreme trauma that they may not be able to express with limited vocabulary. Research on object relations has included a variety of topics, including eating disorders and adult relationships. One study found that bulimia was associated with detachment from parents, whereas anorexia was associated with high levels of guilt and conflict over separation from parents. More recently, Stephen Huprick and colleagues found that both men and women who were insecurely attached and self-focused had greater difficulty in controlling their compulsive eating than did those who were more securely attached and less self-focused. Attachment theory was originally conceptualized by John Bowlby, who emphasized the relationship between parent and child. Since the 1980s, researchers have begun systematically to examine attachment relationships in adults, especially in romantic relationships. The usefulness of attachment theory was investigated in a classic study by Cindy Hazan and Phil Shaver. These researchers found that people with secure early attachments experienced more trust, closeness, and positive emotions in their adult love relationships than did other people. Stephen Rolls and colleagues have extended the research on attachment and adult romantic relationships. They tested the relation of attachment style to the type of information people seek or avoid regarding their romantic partner and relationship. They found their predictions were borne out in that avoidant people showed less interest in information about their partner, while anxious people sought more information. Other recent research has explored the role of attachment styles in the relationships of military officers and their soldiers and other leader-follower relationships. Davidovitz and his colleagues uh, used the same measure of attachment as Rolls et al.'s study, and their results gave further support of the generality and importance of attachment style in various kinds of relationships. Scholars have critiqued object relations theory as focusing personality development as being uh, the product of the early mother-child relationship. The whole relationship is focused on fending off anxiety and fears of abandonment. Object relations theory shares with Freudian theory an inability to be either falsified or verified through empirical research. How can we test hypotheses about what's going on inside an infant's mind? Nevertheless, some clinicians regard the theory as being a useful guide to action and as possessing substantial internal consistency. However, the theory must be rated low on parsimony, it is hardly uh, simple, and also low on its ability to organize knowledge. It is rated moderate in terms of generating research. This theory presents its own unique concept of humanity.
object relations theorists see personality as being a product of the early mother-child relationship. Thus, they stress determinism over free choice. This theory can be pessimistic or optimistic depending on the quality of the relationship. A healthy relationship produces a psychologically healthy child. An unhealthy relationship produces a pathological, self-absorbed personality. Object relations theory tends to be more causal than teleological, as early relations are seen as causing or shaping personality. This approach is high on unconscious determinants because all of these theorists trace the determinants of behavior to early infancy before language. Many personality traits and attitudes are pre-verbal and remain unaware of the complete nature of these traits and attitudes. Because Klein places emphasis on the death instinct and phylogenic endowment, emphasis in this aspect of the theory is placed more on the biological rather than the environmental forces. However, overall, the relation of the mother-child is environmental, and this theory leans toward emphasizing the social determinants of behavior. And finally, object relations theory emphasizes the similarities between people. Most of the discussions in all of these approaches emphasizes the differences between healthy and unhealthy individuals with little understanding of individual personalities and even a healthy personality.